Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not all bad either. I mean, you need, Absolutely. you need the good stress to be able to grow, I think too. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, well, yeah. That's, I think one of the biggest misconceptions is we look at stress as a bad thing. Stress isn't a bad thing. Stress is just a thing. It's, it's a thing that happens to our bodies. And then our body says, Hey, pay attention to this which kind of brings in the conscious mind to kind of problem solve this is what it's supposed to do. But sometimes, especially in today's world, there are no solutions to some of the problems, or you may never have an answer to that question that your brain keeps kind of uh, proposing to you. So, yeah. So looking at stress as just your body's way of communicating something to you, I think is what we should look at stress. But even within science, we have different terms for it. So like distress is negative stress. Stress is just, you know, it can be anything. And then we have eustress, um, which is good stress. That's the kind of stress that we seek when we go on a roller coaster, we go to a horror movie, an action flick, you know, whatever it, it may be. But we pursue stress as well. Yeah, I heard once that animals are the only, um, people are the only animals that don't shudder to to relieve the the stress that all the little all the little mammals and everything they all take time out after they've been stressed to to shudder and release that and, and i guess we don't do that for some reason <laughs> <laughs> yeah humans have well how how we've kind of evolved our society i think is is probably one of the biggest problems because it doesn't really allow us to offload stress to, to offload stress, you really need to be in a state of, of mindfulness and society is built for constant stimulation. You know, whether, you, whether you go into the city, you know, just, just going to a restaurant to get something to eat, there are noises everywhere, different lights, sounds, um, maybe even music playing. It can be really loud where you're yelling, uh, you know. And all, and all these different factors that are constantly stimulating you, and that's excluding the fact that we carry a stimulation device on us, our, our phones, tablets, you know, laptop computers, all these things that are tools to get us to look at a screen, which ultimately results in an ad or some kind of way to direct our attention. And, and so it allows us or disallows us to be in a mindful state. And so instead, we're in a mindless state. And that's a problem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right. <laughs> so um, I, I guess if if someone wants to um, find out more, they should go to your your website. Is it still uh, C O S M I dot L L C? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So uh, Cosme dot L L C, um, and then you can also go to. So I have another website that I'm working on that specifically focuses more on thought architecture, um, advice and information. And that's just uh, drj.com. So drjei.com. And then I'm on Instagram and, and YouTube as Dr. J.
Okay, great. Well, thanks for uh, joining us again today for another episode of um, Define Your Purpose. And um, I'm, I'm with uh, Dr. Jaya Jeremiah Percy today. He's um, a thought architect and a USAF veteran, VA stress consultant out of Houston. Um, so thanks so much for joining us, Dr. Percy. Yeah, thank you for having me, Carl. It's uh, it's my pleasure to be here this morning. Awesome, awesome. So, um, you know, I, I I do like to ask people um, kind of how they got started. Um, you know, maybe maybe that's a, a good place. Um, what what really got you into the early days of your studies of when you were first starting out? Yeah, well, I I think people get into a mental health field because through their life experiences, they have had experiences that have caused them to question, why am I doing this? Or how are people perceiving me in this context? And so that, that that's very much a part of my, uh, I guess, trajectory to this degree and, and this field of study, um, really resulting because I grew up in um, a family that I was adopted into. And so that uh, perspective caused me to be more aware of my experiences in life because I didn't look like any of them. And people around us made sure to ask those questions of why does he look different? So, it, you know, that experience caused me to be, I think, more sensitive to psychological aspects of our life, which, you know, then moving into high school and uh, joining the military. I joined the military when I was 19 and really starting to, well, not starting to, but really losing my identity as you join the military. And then when you get out of the military, it's kind of finding a way to re-identify yourself. And that's the journey I've been on pretty much uh, since I left the military. And ultimately, uh, my, my father left the military as well. So I grew up in the military and then I joined the military. And so it's been a lot of that experience in that culture. And so those kind of have prepped me to think of the world in a very specific way. And I just, as I grew older, I, I got more and more interested in it after my deployment in support of Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan, um, I really started to think about stress and how stress was affecting me. And that just kind of launched me into another field where I worked with um, sexual assault survivors uh, for seven years. I lived in, in Pensacola, Florida. And then uh, currently in Houston, I work with trafficked, uh, trafficked individuals and uh, as well as a, a couple other demographics, LGBTQ community um, <clears throat> and some other facets like that. So it's really just been a kind of life experience that has taught me these skills. And as I've grown, it's really helped me develop and mold them into something that can help other people. That's awesome. That's great. So you were in school and in the Air Force. Um, and then so you did that did what you were learning in school um, help you through the Air Force or um, what got you into teaching then? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Uh, so my degree program when I was in the military was computer science. So it was a, it was a little different. It started me on my academic journey, but uh, I had more of a uh, focus on trying to understand computers than I did people at that time. Um, and that, uh, yeah, and so that kind of uh, led me to, I'm sorry, I forgot the last part of your question. Well, how did that kind of lead you into teaching that you're doing now? Yeah, leading me into teaching. So, uh, I mean, really, that's probably caused or a side effect of being in the military. Part of military training is knowing your job and giving basically reports or presentations on it to the commander, to leadership, you know, whoever it may be. So throughout my military career, I gave dozens, if not hundreds of different presentations, whether it was military weapon systems of enemies that we were engaged with or exactly how we could 
conduct a mission in a specific way to gain specific intelligence. So all of that just kind of gave me the, I guess, confidence in myself to teach. And, you know, as I got more into teaching, it's become something that I really love. I'm very passionate about. And so, yeah, it's just, it's been a journey for that as well. Awesome. So it, it sounds like you do, um, you do mostly teaching these days. What, I mean, what else are you working on? Oh, no, teaching is just uh, one thing that I do. Uh, and it's actually very minimal in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, so I, I teach two classes. I teach spirituality and health and the psychophysiology of the human stress response. Um, sometimes I'll pick up the advanced writing course and some other courses, but those are tend to be less stable. Um, yeah, so so I have that going on, but most of what I'm doing is for my business, Cosme. And that is basically designed to help corporations, institutions, um, nonprofits, you know, whatever your organization composition is. And it's to give them tools and resources to actually manage stress in the workplace, change their culture, you know, whatever they are looking to achieve, I create those programs to help optimize performance, reduce stress, uh, create a better culture around belonging versus ostracism and things like that. So that's most of what I do. I'm involved in a bunch of other projects um, from, from uh, writing a book currently to working with a couple of other military veteran entrepreneurs on a, a bunch of different projects from a transition program for veterans as they're getting out of the service and integrating back into civilian life to re-identify themselves, um, as well as uh, working with nonprofits to reduce uh, mental health stress in collegiate athletes, because there's been a lot of changes to collegiate sports lately that have really disrupted a lot of how it used to function and i think it's put a lot of kids in risk so we're working to kind of resolve some issues there me and a couple of uh, a couple of my colleagues so yeah so that's just a few of the things i'm involved in i have <laughs> i have a ton of projects i'm working on that's great that's awesome what do your what do your clients look like for um for for your business then you, you know the teams that you work with the companies you work with what kinds of companies um, generally? Yeah, so I, I like to work with companies that are doing something to bolster the community. So Goodwill is one. They have a lot of social support programs for military veterans, um, the elderly, the disabled. And so it, it really, supporting an organization like that is what I love to do because they're doing so much and providing so much for the community that they serve. Um, you know, I like to work with a bunch of nonprofits as well that do different things around the city. Uh, but I guess my bigger clients would be like, I've done some work with the Houston Police Department on conflict resolution, and that tends to be a pretty large endeavor. I think the Houston Police Department comprises almost 6,000 individuals across the city. So, you know, it's a pretty good size population of people that are under chronic stress. Uh, typically, just the job itself is a stressful job. Um, yeah, so I have a bunch of things like that going on. And um, uh, other organizations that I've worked with, so like the Veterans Administration, um, VA affiliates, and then mostly uh, other practitioners in the mental health space. But I do partner with churches and other organizations that are affiliated with religion. So I do a lot of work with the uh, uh, African-American Male Wellness Agency. They do a lot of specific uh, support for black men and it typically is done through a spiritual lens. So a bunch of different organizations doing a, a bunch of different things. The great thing about stress is that well, the great thing and also not the great thing is that stress is everywhere. It's involved in everything we do throughout our entire lives and really understanding it and knowing how to leverage it or how to mitigate it 
you know, can be the difference between somebody feeling depressed for 10 years and somebody being able to come out of a depression and still have a fulfilling life. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not all bad either. I mean, you need, Absolutely. you need the good stress to be able to grow, I think too, right? Absolutely. Yeah. That's, cool. Yeah. That's, I think one of the biggest misconceptions is we look at stress as a bad thing. Stress isn't a bad thing. Stress is just a thing. It's, it's a thing that happens to our bodies. And then our body says, hey, pay attention to this, which kind of brings in the conscious mind to kind of problem solve this is what it's supposed to do. But sometimes, especially in today's world, there are no solutions to some of the problems. Or you may never have an answer to that question that your brain keeps kind of uh, proposing to you. So... Yeah, so looking at stress as just your body's way of communicating something to you, I think is what we should look at stress. But even within science, we have different terms for it. So like distress is negative stress. Stress is just, you know, it can be anything. And then we have eustress, um, which is good stress. That's the kind of stress that we seek when we go on a roller coaster, we go to a horror movie an action flick, you know, whatever it, it may be, but we pursue stress as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. So what do you, I know it says um, on, on your profile, you do a lot of breath work. Um, is, that, is that your, um, one of your favorite tools or tactics when you, you go into work with clients on, on stress? Yeah, absolutely. I think breath work is one of the easiest to explain to people. And it is also one of the more impactful that they can do as long as they do it regularly. So just simply knowing that your nervous system is, is kind of bound to how many times you breathe is important to know. And if you know that all you need to do when you're feeling really stressed is to kind of slow down your breathing and that can, that can kind of turn off that fight or flight response and allow you a little more time to process. It can help decrease the uh, intensity of the feelings that you're having. Um, but most importantly, and how I teach people to use it is preventative because once your body becomes stressed, you've already created the basically hormonal soup that it needs to go into a full panic attack or anything like that. Right? So our goal should always be, preventing ourselves from getting to that point, which requires understanding yourself, it requires preparation. And so I teach people to use breath work as a preventative measure because if you do it every day, what you teach your body to do is to be more reactive to stress and allow a, um, and also be more reactive to de-stress. So it will allow your body to get into that fight or flight response state where you can hopefully solve that issue, whatever it is, and then de-stress back to your baseline. And that's typically what gets people into trouble is they don't de-stress enough to offload the stress that they um, that they got through that day. And stress is something that can actually accumulate in your body. So as you accumulate stress, your body actually responds um, or becomes less and less reactive to stress, which is uh, that kind of paralysis or that that state where you don't want to do anything like if you're depressed or chronically stressed you typically don't want to do anything you you're not doing the things that you used to do even for fun you don't want to go to work you don't want to engage with people all these different things come because of, of the state of your nervous system so breath work is a great tool for that yeah i heard once that animals are the only um people are the only animals that don't shudder to to relieve the the stress that all the little all the little mammals and everything they all take time out after they've been stressed to to shudder and release that and, and i guess we don't do that for some reason <laughs> yeah humans have well how how we've kind of evolved our society i think is is probably one of the biggest problems because it doesn't really allow us to offload stress to to offload stress you really need to be in a state of of mindfulness and society is built for constant stimulation. You know, whether you, whether you go into the city, you know, just, just going to a restaurant to get something to eat, there are noises everywhere, different lights, sounds, um, maybe even music playing. 
It can be really loud where you're yelling, uh, you know, and all, and all these different factors that are constantly stimulating you. And that's excluding the fact that we carry a stimulation device on us, our, our phones, tablets, you know, laptop computers, all these things that are tools to get us to look at a screen, which ultimately results in an ad or some kind of way to direct our attention. And, and so it allows us or disallows us to be in a mindful state. And so instead we're in a mindless state and that's a problem. Yeah. It's like, you can't go looking for the calm somewhere else, <laughs> you know, it's cause you're never going to find the calm. I think it almost has to come from, from within, right? Is it, is that the way you'd say it or? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I absolutely would. You know, I mean, it comes back to, um, I forget the actual term, but that kind of pursuit of when I get, let's say a million dollars, if I get a million dollars, all these problems that I have are going to go away. Right. But what we forget is that just because we can solve our current problems with, you know, that, that kind of line of thought, what happens when we get to that and those problems change. You know, I heard a great quote um, recently at, uh, it's called Veteran Edge, but it's a, a conference for veteran entrepreneurs. Um, but, uh, but the quote was, um, success is not no problems. Success is new problems. And I think we forget that as we solve problems, you know, from a business standpoint, as you solve these little problems, you know, getting your social media together, growing your business, you know, finding quality employees, all these different things, right? These are problems. And as you solve them, they create new problems because let's say you need a new employee, you hire a new employee, but now you got to train that new employee. And as the new employee does their job, they may start to expand and do other things and other tasks. And you may require other information from them. And, you know, it shifts and the problem changes. And so I think we have this mentality of, well, I'll just do this. I'll get this. And then that problem will go away. But a new problem crops up. And if you have that mentality, then that new problem is is a bit debilitating or even disheartening. You're like, well, I got the million dollars and I'm still dealing with problems. And so it's really shifting your perspective. And that's when it comes to that inner calmness. Because if you have a perspective of, I'm going to achieve this and be better, well, what about the path to achieving that? Does that mean you just live miserably for until you achieve that thing? Right? But people are not thinking about this in that context. So understanding um, where you want to go, why you want to get there, how you can get there and still be happy, and also how you can be satisfied with your life today, I think is really important. And mindfulness can help with that because typically those kind of things exist in the future. You know, I'm thinking of something that will happen to me in the future. When I get the million dollars, I'll buy that house I want. I'll have that car I want. I'll be, you know, traveling to the places I want to. Um, but it's not always, it's not always realistic and it's not always um, feasible given what life puts us through sometimes. Right. Yeah. People tend to get unrealistic expectations built up, I think. <laughs> So what's the easiest way for someone who um, is maybe not used to ever meditating or ever doing breath work? What's the easiest way for someone to remember, you know, to remember to do that and to get started and, and make that more of a habit? Yeah, that's a great question. I think really to, because meditation and mindfulness have kind of been associated with a level of spirituality in some contexts, or a level of being that people see, whether it's on TV, they hear a story about it, they think that mindfulness or meditation, you have to do a specific thing, you know, like sit in the lotus position, your legs crossed, put your hands on your lap, and you just sit there and do nothing for an hour. It's only for certain types of people doing certain things. Yes. 
Yeah. Right. We, we get these ideas from radio and TV and, you know, reading magazines, whatever it is. But we have this idea of meditation as this thing where your brain completely goes silent. And that means you've reached that state. And so the first thing I like to introduce to people is just understand that meditation is different for every single person. And the goal shouldn't be to completely quiet the whole of your mind. That shouldn't be the success criteria. The success criteria should be, can I sit here and find calmness with myself for five minutes? You can listen to music. You can listen to things like rain sounds. I I like um, kind of white noise. Uh, You can do things like sound baths. Those are one of my favorite uh, to meditate to. It's it's the bowls that give long resonant uh, sounds where I feel like at least part of the mechanism is that it causes a mild dissociation, which actually allows us to get deeper into a meditative state. Um, But I I use a variety of tools to meditate. So I've done um, meditations with African drums, you know, you can find, and you can find all these videos on YouTube. Yeah. I was was just thinking that. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you just look up African drum meditation. There is a drum meditation out there. Um, I like listening to uh, Native American fluting. Um, It's really beautiful and just, I don't know, it does, it's something really beautiful that I found somewhat recently. Um, And then, you know, you have the other aspect of meditation. So you can do it complete silence if you are more capable, but that's as you get deeper into the skill, Um, I, I believe that's when you'll start to experience that state and be able to let go of thoughts. But you shouldn't start there. That shouldn't be your expectation. It should just be sitting there for five minutes. But however you do that, music, um, you know, any of the things that I just mentioned, binaural beats. But then the other aspect is a guided meditation, somebody that provides a direction for you. And I like to do these, and this is how I actually started meditating. I needed somebody to kind of tell me what to experience, where I was going to go, what I was going to see, what I might feel, those kind of things. And the more I experienced that, the more I was able to actually understand my own body and get it to a place where I could really relax, calm, um, and not have my brain going a million different directions. So those are, those are a few things that I typically recommend, but I would say that meditating is different for everybody. So don't, don't just limit yourself to the tools you can find find what works for you if if it's on a bike you can meditate on a bike just enjoying the wind as it blows across your skin maybe with the sunset in front of you and you can just enjoy those sounds and sights and that can be a form of meditation so i think it's really it's really redefining how we think about meditation and mindfulness and making it more inclusive of a lot of human experiences that right now are being excluded by how we define that. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe think about how you're already doing it in your day somewhat. And, and I, I like the, the idea of embracing different, different ways, different ways to try it practices to, to try it out in different, um, modalities, I guess. That's, that's really cool. Yeah, it, it's a, a great skill. And even down to recently, um, I bought a new razor. It's a straight edge razor. Um, and so it's a lot sharper than, you know, the safety razors that you get like a Gillette or a bit, you know, a bit, even a Bic it would be a little safer than this. Um, but what I've realized is it requires me to be more present and mindful, um, especially because I, I shave my head. So I was just wondering, I'm like, geez, <laughs> you be really careful in the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, so I, I mean, I do. I have to be really careful, but it's actually taught me how to be more present as I'm doing that. And it becomes more of an enjoyable thing. So it's really just finding how you can be more present in life. Doing something like that is something I never would have thought of, but as I do it more and more, it becomes easier and easier to be mindful around that. It takes less time, all those kind of things. But um, 
you know, create the life or create a lifestyle that supports the life you want. That's what I would say. You know, you can be mindful in a lot of different ways from cooking to shaving your head to vacuuming to, you know, whatever the task may be. And so, yeah, explore for yourself. Right. Yeah. 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 That's great advice. And I, I think also that the universe gives back whatever vibration you put out. So I, I think that by, by practicing, like you're, you're saying, then you're elevating your vibration and having a good vibration and then you get good things back in return. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, I think you put into the world what you'll get back from the world. And so I just, I do my best to be positive and, and put as much positivity, hope, um, tools, advice into the world as I can. Just there, there are a lot of people that are struggling. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, if you, if you had to do over again, everything that you've done, um, how, what would you do differently? <laughs> I, hmm. I don't, I don't think I would do, yeah. Um, I don't think I would do anything different if I'm being entirely honest. There, the only thing that I may change, but if I changed it, then I think it would have changed the way that I think. Um, it may have been to do a clinical doctorate versus, um, versus a, a research one. So I'm a cognitive psychologist. I got my degree in cognitive psychology. So I don't practice clinically. Um, but in some contexts, I wish I had that clinical license. But overall, like I said, the cognitive training I got actually helped me, I think, more than anything else. And so I think I would have missed that piece and I would have been a lot more I would have had a lot more kind of in the box thinking versus the direction that it took me because cognitive psychology led to psychophysiology, which is the blend of psychology and physiology. And that's really where things started to make sense. I started to see how um, pain in my body that I was experiencing was actually caused by things that I could control. Um, like, uh, for example, stretching. <laughs> You know, you don't realize sitting at a desk all day can actually cause a lot of back and neck pain, cause headaches, all kinds of things. And when you figure that out, you can start to change your lifestyle around that. And, and that's kind of what that trajectory has allowed me to do. And I've become pretty proficient at it. So I, I don't think I would change anything. I think I needed every single experience that I've had to get me to the place I am today and be the person I am. And I... You know, I, I do the best, <laughs> the best I can, but I, I like who I am and where I'm going and I'm not perfect, but. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of have to appreciate the, the setbacks, I guess, and the problems and. Yep. The setbacks, the problems, the difficult experiences, and even in some cases, trauma, um, because we don't get to control really what happens to us in life. And if we focus on the things that we can't control, then the things that we can get kind of lost. So I just, I appreciate the experiences I've had. I try to learn from them and I just put one foot in front of the other. Right on. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a skill though, not yeah. Yeah. Can yeah. do that, unfortunately. <laughs> So what are you what are you most excited about this year coming up? Uh, I think, well, recently, actually, at that Veteran Edge conference, um, I met some some really interesting entrepreneurs that are working with AI, and so we have started some conversations around AI and uh, mental health and how. We can use some of the skills that I've developed and knowledge that I have to actually be more effective with with AI. So we have some projects like that that are really interesting uh, that will be coming up. Um, 
I'll be launching a nonprofit here pretty soon. We've kind of already launched, but we're still working on a couple of different things. Um, but the the National Sports Association for Mental Fitness and, and Wellness um, will be launching soon. And basically, we're going to try to help these student athletes with their mental fitness and help these institutions a- address kind of some of the issues that we see with where sports is going and how it can impact kids. So things like that, I'm really excited about. Uh, Anytime I have the chance to work with veterans, I'm doing a lot of work with veterans right now, um, designing stress management programs for them. You know, that, that makes me happy. So those are a couple of things that, you know, are in the future on the horizon, but we'll see where, we'll see where it goes. I'm, I tend to be pretty flexible and I have a ton of irons in the fire at any given point. So right. yeah. that's great. That's a good way to be. Me too. Yeah. I mean, you got to stay busy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. So um, I, I guess if, if someone wants to um, find out more, they should go to your, your website. Is it still uh, C O S M I dot LLC? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so uh, Cosme.llc, um, and then you can also go to, so I have another website that I'm working on that specifically focuses more on thought, thought architecture, um, advice and information, and that's just uh, drj.com, so drjei.com, and then I'm on Instagram and, and YouTube as Dr. J as well. Awesome, awesome. Can you talk a little bit more about the, the you know, your, your projects that you're, you're doing with that and all with this new website? Uh, yeah, well, the, the new website is more for because I have so many projects going on. It's become apparent that, uh, you know, some of them are tied to my business. Some of them aren't. And so I, I needed kind of a central place for people to get a variety of information about what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. So the Dr. J website is going to serve as that. So it'll have uh, information about Cosme, the National Sports Association. It's gonna have um, information about my VA program and all of that kind of stuff that I'm working on currently. Uh, In the future, it's gonna have all of my events and it will have all of my videos and stuff like that. So. It's just going to be the more central place to kind of find me and what I do. And then from that, you can go to the other things that I'm involved. In. Nice. Awesome. And the, the book will be out this month, you think? <laughs> yeah, I wish. I wish. Uh, no, the, the goal for the book is, is end of the year. So, um, yeah, still some work to do on that. And I have, you know, I'm involved in a couple of scientific studies and stuff like that. So I, I just have a lot on my plate right now. But. Uh, the goal is the end of the year and it will be, it's actually the aim of it is to actually understand how to ask yourself or how to get yourself to a place of changing your lifestyle. And so it's all about asking yourself good questions and how we can kind of change our minds by simply asking questions that, that help us see things in a different light. Mm, Interesting. So you, you help people recreate their routines and, and their, their day-to-day with this? Yeah, it's going to have suggestions for what you can do for routine, for habit control, for how to utilize these questions, for how to think about these topics. And really, it's to encourage people to actually think about their life and what's going on in it. Because when we are stressed and you know the american psychological association has done a lot of studies on stress lately and shown that 80 percent of americans are stressed when they go to work which means we're likely stressed almost all day and so it's really getting to a place of understanding how all of that is playing into your life and if you're happy or unhappy in it right and then What actions can you take when you decide that you're not quite where you want to be? Um, I guess that can be, that can be hard too. Um, I think a lot of people end up feeling criticized. Absolutely. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You, you can feel criticized. And then, you know, again, with the state of our society and social media specifically, we have a comparison to make against people that are doing all these things on TikTok and YouTube and Instagram. And we can look at those and go, this person's 33 and, you know, I'm 43 and I didn't achieve that. Why couldn't I achieve that? What what have I accomplished with my life? I haven't done anything. And then you can go down that spiral of, you know, what, you know, that, that tends to be the midlife crisis right there. Uh, yeah. So you, you, you were able to navigate that and now you're helping others navigate that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a weird contemplation that occurs when you look back at your life and you're like, Whoa, okay. Um, especially now that, uh, you know, you can look at an 18 year old and say, well, <laughs> now I'm double that person's age and, <laughs> you know, things like that. Uh, yeah, it happens so quick. It seems like yesterday, you know, you're in high school and now all of a sudden you're, you know, middle-aged with the family and life is different than what you expected or hoped it would be. And so, yeah, reconciling that and actually trying to understand what that thing was, because more, more often than not, somebody that feels that they didn't achieve something never really set a a kind of boundary or a not a boundary a definition for what they want to achieve so you know for example i want money okay but when you get that what is it that you were hoping to achieve with that money right and, and that is the problem if you pursue that thing and then you get it and you didn't define it well, then where do you go from there? Well, I got this amount of money, so I guess my next goal has got to be five million, then ten million, you know, then a hundred million, then you know, five hundred million, and it, it just kind of goes on until you're never really satisfied because you never actually articulated what would make you satisfied. So yeah, 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 that's important. That's probably probably key if you want to change things, I think, is to uh, make that distinction right away as soon as possible, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I like to equate it to your car smoking, right? If your car engine is smoking, you have to lift up the hood and look inside to figure out what's going on. I mean, you, a mechanic, somebody does, right? <laughs> so... But it's weird that we don't have the same thought pattern when it comes to our own brain and body. If your body is breaking down and you're stressed all the time and you aren't taking the time to actually go, huh, what can I change in my life or what about my life needs to be changed in order for me to not be smoking, uh, essentially, right? So you have to understand yourself before you can you know, fix the issues going on. So is, is there anything else that um, we didn't get to talk about today, maybe that you wanted to highlight or, or bring up? Um, uh, I mean, I don't know that I have anything else to add. I think this was a pretty in-depth conversation. We talked about a lot of different topics and yeah. Um, yeah, I would just in encourage people to think about what, well, not even think about what they want, but think about their life as an ecosystem. Right. If any part of the ecosystem changes, it's going to change the whole of the ecosystem. And so the concept I teach is the human ecosystem and how our environment, how what we eat, how who we're around, how much we sleep, um, you know, how much physical activity do we have? Are you practicing breath work? 
you know, what are you doing to grow yourself? You know, all these different things. How does that combine to create the life that you're experiencing today? And what can, you know, and what aspects of that are not helpful for you? Or what could you change? And just kind of looking at it as an amalgamation of everything in life versus just looking at ourselves as an individual. Uh, that would be, I guess, a takeaway that I would say is to really start looking at this web complexity that is your life and what things make you feel good and what things make you feel bad and start prioritizing the things that make you feel good and getting rid of um, or unprioritizing the things that make you feel bad. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think maybe take a close look at how you're spending your time too. It's so easy to let that get get away and then you just are left complaining about how you don't have time for anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, and that's our most valuable resource. You never get that back. So spend it wisely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I hope we can uh, catch up again soon. I'd, I'd love to have another conversation. Um, I'm going to be having some events, um, hopefully launching my own book before too long also. So <laughs> I'd, I'd love to uh, catch up soon and, and have you back on uh, the show here. Or <laughs> 